I moved up from Hawaii, and I was a signed artist to Motown Records at 18. I got signed really quick. I was a little wet behind the ears. I didn't know what I was doing, and basically figured out that you really got to do it by yourself. You got to do everything. You know, it's not like in the movies where you get signed and all of a sudden you're working with Timbaland and you know hit songs are coming your way. It's, and I, plus, I was trying to do something different, so it was getting frustrating for me to try to explain the kind of music I wanted to do. Instead, I, I just needed to do it. And uh, Motown thing didn't work out, but in the meantime, I met Philip Lawrence. And awesome. Oh. He's an awesome guy. <laughs> All right. Where I came from. Met Phil, and because of his awesomeness, we just started songwriting. And I kind of put the artist thing in the back burner and started writing songs. And uh, we figured out that in this, in the, kind of, in the kind of songwriting that we do, where we go bounce around from different uh, producer to producer, there's no real money in songwriting unless you write some big hit. And then even then, you guys know how it works, but you guys gotta get residuals. So we're like, yo, we can't even afford gas to go to the studio to write these songs. We need to start producing, because that's where the money's at. Yeah. <laughs> and that's where this little guy comes. <laughs> so he had a studio down the street, and Philip, Philip and him worked together a long time before, and we started going to his place and started being like a one-stop shop. So we would produce the record, and write the record, and we could pay rent. <laughs> yeah, finally, you could pay rent, because it was a little while. Yeah. But you know, you just said something, Bruno, that I think is worth following up on, which is, which is no one really understood what kind of music you wanted to, to create as an artist. When you were signed to Motown, <clears throat> they may have had a specific idea in mind, but I think it was a little bit of a struggle for them, for you, because they kept trying to put you into a certain box. They wanted you to be a certain kind of singer. Well, yeah, I think, you know, it's like, I'm pretty unorthodox. If you listen to the singles, like, a, like Nothing On You was this kind of hip hop love jam. And then I do like a like Billionaire, which became like this island reggae thing. And Grenade is this hard, heavy, you know, like it's kind of all over the place. Mm. And I think that scares um, suits. Yeah. You know, because I don't know, they, they, <coughs> they don't know where the hell they want to put, like, what am I? Right. You know, who, what audience do we cater him to? And I just told him, the universe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really small. <laughs> so Phil, when you guys first started writing together, I mean, you clearly knew that you had a talented guy on your hands. But yeah. were you were you satisfied and happy just supporting and, and co-writing and saying, okay, well, th this may be it. We may just be writers and producers, and maybe the artist thing isn't going to work out. Or was there always a plan in the back of your mind to help Bruno get to where he wanted to be? Well, you know, to a label and that's a good question, Randy. You know, the kind of guy that I am, you know, I'm kind of a mastermind, you know oh, what God. I mean? So I kind of always knew that it was going to pop off. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Now, I remember when Bruno and I first met through a mutual friend of ours, um, I was just excited to finally finish songs. Like, I had, you know, been doing sort of the, the solo bounce around town sort of thing, working with different producers and whatnot. And it was hard to just finish a song. Like, you know what I mean? Like, so many distractions. You don't like this track. The producer doesn't want to change, you know, the melody of the track. So you're stuck to writing to that. And it was just this never-ending cycle of incompleteness that ended when he and I started working together. And the first night that we met, what was it, 96, 97? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> first, first night we met, we finished an entire song, and it was just so gratifying, you know. So in a way, I, I complete you. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's the fun part about music, is that it's you get whatever you want, you know. And and it's like Ari would come up with a line. He was drunk the night before, saying something to his girl, and say like, "Yo, I taught you know," and we'll make that a song. Or uh, you know, he'll come up with some kind of drum beat in his head, and that, that's how it works. Ari, you and I talked about this a little bit last year, but it's, it's not something that is, you, you know, you're not sitting there thinking at the moment like, you know what, radio is going to be all over this because they're just, they can't wait to be playing this song, but it clearly... You know what that song teaches you? Fuck radio. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hold on Who to that Who pin back there to clap for me? This is right? great. <laughs> no, you know what, it, it, was, it was like, first of all, we were all nervous. Um, CeeLo has been such like a inspiration for me, especially, like I said, when I was really frustrated with Motown because I wanted to do this, this, this. When, when Niles Barkley came out and they touched on all these different styles of music and Crazy came out, 
that was a song to me that was like, man, I, that's, the, that's like a song that I wish I wrote, mm. wish I had anything to do with that song. I wish it was my song because it just, it was, I remember it playing on rhythmic radio, pop radio, alternative radio, just because it was like something no, one, no one's ever heard before. Yeah. And we knew that CeeLo was coming in and we wanted to have something special for him. And that's where that came. And, and, and we just started jamming. He walked in, I said, what do you think of this? I see you driving around town with a girl I love. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Uh, what do you think? <laughs> no? And we almost didn't even sing it for him. We almost didn't no sing it, yeah, because it was like, it. is this like an SNL skit? Like, is this, right. is, you know what? But he goes, in, in that C low voice, he goes, man, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, he goes that, that's amazing. And then he said, and you know, he was like, but he was like, I need to, I need to say, um, cause we're saying fuck you to the guy. Yeah. But he's like, I want to tell her fuck you. So he goes, you know, he used to start going on a rant and he said, <laughs> he was like, fuck you and fuck her too. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, that was literally like, if, if you can, w I wish we had a video camera rolling because that was like a dream collaboration. Like if you ever wanted to write a song with somebody and we finish that song. First of all, it's hard to work with CeeLo because he's in and out the studio. He's like, I gotta go get a massage or just do something. <laughs> <laughs> he's always doing something, right? But he stayed and we finished the song in one day. Wow. And, yeah. and the way it built, because that's all we had. So we're singing and we're riffing and it sounds good, but now the track is, is, is sounding like, it's not, the track is not good. And we started messing around with the piano and that's when dun 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 dun, yeah. that came up. Yeah, before and that it was just like before that it was just kind of being sustained piano chords that it didn't give it that that soulful feeling, yeah. and um, that was the game changer. That riff, that dun 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 dun, and I was just like, man, that get, that sounds so good, but I feel like we're about to get sued because how can no one have done this before? Bum, bum, bum. Yeah, mm. but we didn't get sued. No, <laughs> didn't and it really does. But we got some Rolexes. Why? <laughs> You're good. Thank you, ASCAP. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Oh, God. Now we're going to get sued. Now, One yeah. of you guys are going to sue right. us. That's great. Well, so what about, what about other writing experiences? Nothing on you, which was, which was one of the first times you, you had recorded with other people and, and been on other people's records. But that was really, I think, the first time it was like a record B.O.B. featuring Bruno Mars and kind of the introduction to you as an artist. How did that collaboration come about? Had you been working with him before? No, well, Nothing on You was a year old before we even, like, the concept was about a year old. We always had, <clears throat> we always had beautiful girls all over the world. They got nothing on you. And one day we started doing this track, and because um, it was a different melody. Yeah, it was a, a terrible. It was, it was a terrible really melody. Bad. And, um, and the, the did you think it was, was a terrible melody? Artist? And the track was for a different artist. And we were working with her, and she was just like, "Nah, I don't like it." And he was just like, "Save that, save that, put it to the side, put it to the side." Yeah. Stupid yeah. artist. <laughs> <laughs> but when you say you, it, it was a, it was so you had it to a different melody, and you thought it was a terrible melody. I mean, did you at the time think it was a terrible melody, or wasn't until you? No. I, I think we just grew from as a, as songwriters and understand. See, I feel like why nothing on you is so good is because of the beautiful girls all over the world, and then that the next line, I could be chasing, but my time would be wasted. They got nothing on you. Like that makes it interesting. Uh -huh. They might say hi, and I might say hey, but you don't have to worry. I think that's what made it interesting. That's why I think all love songs should be. It's like um, there's a bit of conflict in it mm -hmm. instead of just beautiful girls all over the world. They got nothing on you. Right. Boring. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you guys obviously think about these things. I mean, you're, 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 how much, how much of the process is it that you go back and I mean, even now as you're as you're working on new songs and stuff like that, are you constantly going back and saying, oh, you know, we picked up that thing 30 days ago or a month ago, but now let's look at it again and see if it's really worth it. You know, you, you've probably now set the standard and the bar so high for yourselves that you know, is it challenging? Is it more difficult this time around? I don't know. It, I think it happens a lot, you know, because because fortunately we've been blessed to have the kind of success that we've had, and we can remember being in the studio in those moments and it feeling special, you know what I mean? It feeling like we're doing something like really special. So if we don't have that feeling 
when we're in the middle, in the midst of working on something, we're like, all right, well, let's go away, sleep on it, let's do it in the car, and see if we can kind of elevate it. And if not, then we'll just move on to something else. Yeah, that's the, if any advice we yeah. can give to anybody is don't think that everything you do is hot. Right. You know, like, every, every probably not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> uh, you, you, you have to understand that it's a, it's like a, it's a numbers game, and mm -hmm. it has to be something that really, really does something to, to you and to everybody else. Yeah. And I think with like with nothing on you and F you, fuck you, <laughs> you know, that, that's how we felt. So it's important to remember those feelings when you write those songs. Right. You, and you kind of knew in the moment that... Just that it's special to us. Yeah. You know, like we know that radio's not going to play a song with a swear word like that. He says yeah. it like 19 times in the song. Yeah, right. But it, it just felt so right. It felt like that's what you would, he would say to his girl. Yeah. She left him for money, for a guy with more money.